Chapter 9 is all about the concept of a significance test. And this is the most important chapter we have left in this class, because when we learn how to do significance tests, we use them in chapters 9, 10, 11, and 12. I've talked about um, statistical inference a lot this semester, which means just kind of using our data at hand to make predictions or generalizations about our population. And the two main tools that you use when you're doing statistical inference, we have the confidence interval, which we just learned about, but the significance test is just as important, if not even more important, than a confidence interval. Those two pieces are such a big deal and so central to anything you would do with statistics in your own life if you're doing research, etc. You guys are probably getting sick of seeing me do this every single chapter here, but at the bottom, I have listed out just the big picture for you guys so you can see where things are headed. Section 9.1, we're wrapping our heads around this new idea of significance testing. Then in 9.2, we learn how to do our new concept for P problems. And in 9.3, we'll learn how to do the same concept for mu problems. So let's get to it. Our first example, my face is like in the way here, so I'll move that a bit. Um, if you want to read through this problem for yourself, basically what we're looking at in this problem, um, they did a study back in 2012 on CEOs, and they were curious if the month that you're born in has any sort of an influence or impact on whether you become a CEO later on in life. So they took a bunch of CEOs, random sample of 375 CEOs. And they looked at the percent that were born in June and July. I don't know exactly where the cutoffs are for school, but I think the kids in June and July, like I think August is the cutoff maybe. So like the June and July kids are like the youngest in your grade. So the argument is, well, maybe those kids who are younger than everybody else in June and July are at a disadvantage of sorts and later on in life are less likely to become CEOs. So that's what the study was looking at. Does the month you're born in have any sort of a connection to whether or not you become a CEO? So in this problem, they took a random sample of 375 CEOs and found that 12% of the CEOs in their sample were born in June and July. Is this convincing evidence that the true proportion of all CEOs born in June and July is smaller than two over 12? So let me just kind of talk you through what's going on right here because we're gonna end up using this problem to springboard into our new concept of significance testing. The idea is, in this problem, if the month you were born in didn't matter for being a CEO, we would expect to see about the same number of CEOs born in January, February, March, April, etc. And obviously, um, like February is a little shorter of a month than other months, so there's, it's not a perfect comparison because there's slightly different number of days there. But if we take two months, June and July, just simplistically thinking, we would expect about two twelfths. That's two months out of the 12 for this year. So we would expect about two twelfths of our CEOs to be born in those months. Now, if you actually find two twelfths as a decimal and you actually figure out what percentage that is, this right there, two out of 12, is like a 16 0.6 repeating percent. So it's 16 percent ish. But in our sample, we only got 12 percent of the CEOs who were born in June and July. So it asks us first off, what's the evidence that June and July birthdays may be underrepresented here? Well, we got a 12 percent, but if it was uniformly distributed across the months, we'd expect around a 16 percent. So the evidence that people born in June and July are underrepresented, our sample proportion, I'm doing a bad thing here and not defining P. Oh, actually, I guess they did that in the problem. I didn't feel like writing it out, but they said in the problem that P is the proportion born in June and July. So our P hat was going to be 0.12, which is not equal to the expected proportion of 0.166, which 
we'd expect to see around 16% if the month you were born in doesn't matter, but we got 12%. So a lot of what we're going to be doing in this chapter is looking at what we got versus what we were supposed to get. So going from like 12% to 16%, is that a big deal? Are those far enough apart that like something is going on? If we got a 12% and we were supposed to get like an 80%, I'd be like, yeah, there's a difference there. For sure, there's something going on. But at what point is it like too close where it's not a big deal and our sample could have just happened due to sampling variability? Okay, that is what we're gonna kind of put a number to in this chapter. So anytime we're looking at what we got versus what we were supposed to get, you have to explain that happening in one of two ways. There are two possibilities for why we did not match. The first option is that people born in June and July birthdays really do have a disadvantage. So it is possible that being um, in a June or July birthday means that there is some sort of disadvantage, um, the being younger in their grades, et cetera. And that's why we saw a lower percentage. So we could have gotten our 12% because June and July actually is worse off. So it was lower because those months are at a disadvantage. The second possibility is that the percent, dif the difference that we got right there is just due to chance. So the second possibility for why we didn't get the answer we expected, there is no disadvantage and our lower p hats occurred due to chance. Oops, occurred due to chance. So it was supposed to be a 16%. There really are 16.6% .6 of June and July birthdays who are CEOs. We just happened to pick a sample that had less of them than usual, okay? Anytime you do one of these tests, you can always break it into these two possibilities. Yeah, there is a difference, something's up, and oh, there's no difference. What we got is basically just a coincidence. Those are the two kind of thought processes that we always explore in this chapter. And we're going to build a bunch of fancy math and statistics to figure out which of these two blue scenarios actually is true. That's what this chapter is about. What we need to do to make this happen is we need to find the probability, that color is hard to see, sorry, find the probability of option number two. I'll change colors. So what we want to do is we want to find the probability for this guy right here. It says our lower p hat occurred due to chance. Well, what are the chances of getting that lower p hat? In other words, if you're supposed to get a 16%, how likely is a 12%? Measuring that difference right there, how likely it is to occur. So what we'll end up doing with this, if we find that that probability is higher, So if the probability of getting a lower p hat is kind of high, what that would tell us is that option two is probably true. So option two is likely. So if getting a lower p hat occurring to chance is pretty likely, well then this is what I would go with right here. Let's say that we had a lower probability for option number two. So the probability of getting our low p hat is pretty rare. If that was true, that would lead me to believe, like if there was like a one in a million shot of getting a 12% when you're supposed to get 16, then I'd be like, well, it probably is a disadvantage because how likely is it that you would pick that one in a million possibilities and get a 12%. So if you have a lower probability for this guy right here, what that would tell us is that option one is more likely. And then what we're gonna end up doing in this chapter is figuring out where that cutoff is. Like I just said, lower probability, higher probability. Where is the cutoff? 
what do we like where do we put that line in the sand where we choose one of those blue options over the other and that's what we're going to build up in this chapter so let's go ahead and look at our next slide in order to be able to analyze a problem like the one we just talked about you have to first set up what are called the hypotheses for your significance test. Most kids have a pretty good idea about the word hypothesis. You've learned it in like elementary school science classes and stuff, and you have an idea that a hypothesis is basically what you think is going to happen. It's kind of like that, but it's a lot more specific and detailed the way that we set up our hypotheses in any sort of research setting. Every statistical test you will do will have two hypotheses. You have what's called the null hypothesis, and you have what's called the alternative hypothesis, and we will set these up every time we do one of these problems. The null hypothesis in a problem is going to be called the statements of no difference And it basically represents the status quo. If you're not familiar with that term, status quo is what's already kind of happening. So basically the null hypothesis is a little bit like going in like, oh yeah, nothing's going on here. Everything's cool. There's nothing suspicious. It's just status quo. And then you have the alternative hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis is gonna be a statement about the population that you are trying to find evidence for. So we're going to do this at the bottom of the slide here, but just to give you guys an idea of where, what this means, in our CEO problem, the null hypothesis would basically be saying, oh yeah, nothing suspicious is going on. June and July birthdays, no different than anything else. Just nothing crazy is going on right here. Then the alternative hypothesis, we think, hmm, maybe June and July birthdays actually do have a disadvantage. So we'd be finding evidence for that. So that's going to be in like conceptually what's going on. We're going to learn how to do all this with symbols on this slide. First of all, the symbol for a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis, you're going to put a capital H with a subscript of zero or O below it. So your H O is your null hypothesis. And then your alternative hypothesis is going to be H A. I use a lowercase a with a tail. Make sure it's obvious that there's a tail on it since they look sort of similar. You could do a capital A, but you see lowercase more often. So you have your null hypothesis, H O, your alternative, H A. And there are going to be three main rules that I want you guys to use when you are writing hypotheses for a significance test. So three things you have to be able to keep straight. The first thing I want you guys to write down is that your null hypothesis, HO, always has an equals. HO will always have an equal sign. HA, your alternative hypothesis, will have a less than, greater than, or a not equal to sign. So those are going to be your options for HA. And whenever you do a hypothesis, um, hypothesis test or significance test, always put it in terms of your parameter not the statistic. What does that mean? Well, just like last chapter, when we made a confidence interval, we would make it on mu or on p. We did not make a confidence interval for x bar or for p hats. When you're doing a significance test, always, always, always put it in terms of your parameter. So it's mu or it's p or it's something else that's a parameter. I grade AP tests. I graded for the first time this past summer, and it's really crazy the number of kids who will put like X bar or something like that when it's supposed to be the parameter. So make sure you're careful with that. 
So in our problem down here at the very bottom, we're going to state our null and alternative hypotheses for the CEO problem. Be sure to define the parameter of interest first. Underline that because you always have to define your parameters when you do one of these problems. I'll do that over here where I have a little bit of space. We cared about P, which was the true proportion of CEOs born in June and July. So if I was going to set up hypotheses for this problem, my HO and my HA, HO always has an equal sign, always an equal sign. So P would equal, what would it equal in this problem? Is it the 12 or is it the 16% that we got earlier? Well, HO is the statement of no difference or the status quo. And if nothing suspicious or weird was going on right here, we would expect June and July to be the same as all the other months. So it's the two out of 12 or 0.16 that we would expect real P to equal. And then we had a suspicion in the problem that actually June and July birthdays were gonna be at a disadvantage. So we are looking for evidence that P is actually, in fact, less than 16%. You have the status quo, and you have what you're trying to collect evidence for as your alternative hypothesis. And this is how you would set up one of these examples. We will practice this in another example on the next slide or two, but this is a really, really important concept that you have to get comfortable with. Every significance test problem starts with setting up your hypotheses. So very, very big deal. So let's look at a fresh setting right here and see what you guys can do with this. So this guy is a really avid golfer here and he wants to try out a new golf club. He knows based on tons of years of experience what his average is and what his standard deviation is for his old clubs. He wants to look for a new club and he wants his new club to be more consistent, in other words, less variable than his old club. So he takes this new golf club out and he tests it out, okay? So the first thing we're gonna do is set up hypotheses and define the parameter. If you're feeling adventurous, pause me and see if you can set that up for yourself. It'd be good practice here, but I'll talk about it in just a second. So when you set up a hypothesis test or a significance test, it's all about what you care about in the problem. If Mike wanted to hit the golf balls farther and wanted a higher average, well, we'd be testing mu. But just because it was what Mike was interested in, he didn't care about hitting the ball farther. He cared about being more consistent or less variable. That means the variable or the parameter that we're going to test is not mu. We're actually going to test sigma because we want to be less variable. So the first thing you do is you set up your parameter of interest. Sigma is going to be the true standard deviation of Mike's drives. And would it be with the new golf club or the old golf club? What are we trying to test? It would be the new golf club here. We already know his stats for the old golf club. So we want to see what the standard deviation is of Mike's drives with the new club, okay? So that is the parameter that we are testing. Again, you always put HOHA in terms of your parameter. It would be a bad thing if I said S right here. I would lose major points if I did a sample um, symbol instead of a population symbol. HO always has an equal sign and basically, we go in, it's called the statement of no difference or the status quo. I've got this new golf club right here. I'd be like, hey, this new golf club is just as good as the old golf club. They're no different than each other. Statement of no difference. This club is no different than this one. So we would go into this problem saying, hey, you know what? This new golf club, no better than the old one. Always an equal sign for HO. Then we'd set up our alternative and that is all about what we are looking for in the problem. So it's what we're trying to collect evidence for. He is hoping that he will be more consistent, or in other words, less variable. 
So he's looking for evidence that his new standard deviation is actually smaller than 15. If for some crazy reason, Mike wanted to like be more all over the place, more variable, we could have that sigma is greater than 15. It's all about what you're looking for evidence on, okay? So what is the difference between a one-sided and a two-sided significance test? New vocab right here. A one-sided test is gonna be your less thans and your greater thans. Both of the tests, this one right here, and the CEO problem are one-sided tests. They were both less thans. A two-sided test is going to be a situation where you have a not equal to. That should make conceptual sense right here. If you think it's less or you think it's greater, that's one direction. You're going this way or you're going this way. If you have a two-sided test where you just think it's not equal to, well, that could be less than or it could be greater than. So it goes two directions there. In order to figure out what it is you're looking for, how can you decide which to use? It is all about the wording of the problem. So in the problem, you're gonna look at the wording and that will tell you what type of test is appropriate. Here it said he wants to be more consistent. So that led us to say a less than. Let's say this same problem, instead of saying more consistent was like, oh, he's wondering if the new club is different, where he doesn't really have an opinion one way or the other. Maybe the new club's better, maybe it's worse, I don't know. I just care if it's different. Well, then you would wanna do a two-sided test. So it's all about the wording of the problem, which type of HA situation you're dealing with. All right, very, very important slide right here. So this slide is a big script for us. We're going to learn a script for something called a p-value. And way back at the beginning of these slides here, I'm going to tab back real fast. We looked at the probability for option number two right there. The probability of getting what we got in our sample, assuming there was actually no difference. That like probability we found is something called a p-value, or the probability we discussed over here. So let me go ahead and define a p-value for you and give you like a little script that you can use. The p-value calculates the probability. So a p-value is a probability of getting, you know what, I'm actually gonna go and I'm just gonna put it, I'm gonna basically say the same thing twice. So I'm just gonna put this straight in the script format here. So I'm gonna put it up there and then I'll talk about it. So give me just a sec here. All right, so I figured it was easier just to write it up there and then talk about it once it's there. So go ahead and copy this down and then you can um, pause if you need to write it first and then talk about it right now. But uh, make sure you understand this slide as I talk about it because it's a really important slide. This was another topic on this year's AP test and it was just one of the worst problems I graded in terms of just kids not fully understanding how to interpret a p-value. Very important script we've got going on right here. So what a p-value does is you guys can read on here. You assume that your null hypothesis is true. So assuming that whatever your null hypothesis says is true, the probability of getting what we get in our sample or more extreme due to chance is approximately the p-value. That's gonna make a lot more sense in the context of a specific problem. So at the bottom here, we're gonna apply this to that CEO example from earlier. And in blue, I wrote down a reminder of what the CEO thing said. We were looking at the proportion born in June and July. HO, the null hypothesis, was that it's 16% and then we were looking for evidence that it was less than 16%. Remember that in the CEO problem, our uh, sample proportion, we got P hat equals 0.12. Our sample was a 12%. And at the beginning of this lesson, what I was doing is I was saying, oh gosh, 12% versus 16%, is that a big deal? Could that happen? Or is that really rare versus like 12 to 80% or something like that? So we are actually putting a number 
when we talk about p-value, to how far apart those two things are, 12 versus 16. So the way we would word this in our CEO problem, we would start by assuming the true proportion of CEOs born in June, July is 16%. So you assume that HO is true. Assuming that it actually is 16%. So if that's the actual answer, assuming that the status quo is true, getting what we got for our sample. So getting, I guess it's the probability, the probability of getting a sample proportion of 12% or more extreme, so more extreme means just like even crazier than that. If this was a two-sided test, it would count both of those, more extreme. So what I care about in a one-sided test, we were looking for evidence that it's less than 16%. So in a one-sided test, you don't have to say more extreme, you could just say or less. If it was a greater than test right here, you could say or greater. So for a one-sided test, you can say less or greater. More extreme talks about both directions. So the probability of getting a sample proportion of 12% or less it, due to chance alone is approximately the p-value, 0 0.008. Um, the abbreviation for p-val, I usually just write, don't write p, because p is spoken for, we use it for proportion, etc. Usually with p-val, I abbreviate it like you see right here. So what is this even saying? If there's no difference in June and July birthdays, June and July birthdays are nothing special for CEOs. Us getting a 12% when we were supposed to get a 16%, the probability of that happening is pretty darn low. It's not even a 1% probability. So 0 0.008 is the probability of that happening. Okay, I'll say that again. If we're supposed to get a 16%, because June and July isn't special, getting a 12%, which is what we already got, it's what we got in our sample, that happens super, super rarely. Okay? So when we look at that, I talked earlier about what decision you would make. We got a 12%, but it was super crazy unlikely that we would get a 12%. So what that should tell us is probably it's not 16% like we assumed. Probably there is a disadvantage in June and July birthdays, and June and July birthdays actually are lower. That's kind of the thought process that we would follow in handling this problem. So that low probability would tell me June and July birthdays probably actually are lower than 16% of all CEOs. This is a lot, and I'm sure it's somewhat confusing watching this. It becomes a lot better with practice. So don't freak out if you're like not really sure what's going on yet. You will get there on these problems. But that is the basic thought process that we follow. So we're going to look at this golf club example again. And for this golf club example, remember that these were our hypotheses here. Sigma is 15 versus sigma is less than 15, sigma is the true standard deviation of his new golf club. Based on a sample of shots with his new golf club, Mike gets a sample standard deviation of 13.9. So in this test, Mike went in saying, oh, my old golf club has a standard deviation of 15. He tests out the new golf club and he finds, oh yeah, I got a 13.9 for my standard deviation. So what is the evidence that the new golf club is actually better? Well, Mike's new sample standard deviation is 13.9, which is less than 15. 
I guess instead of saying new sample standard deviation, I could just say S is 13.9, which is less than 15. So basically, Mike takes his 50 swings right here, and he's like, oh gosh, my new club has a standard deviation in this sample of 13.9. So anytime you do a significance test, what you're going to do is you're going to have what you were supposed to get versus what you actually got. So let's say for a second, Mike, his old club was a 15, okay? Then he does this new golf club, and he gets a 16 for his new golf club. He actually did worse. He wouldn't sit there and be like, well, gosh, is this new club actually better? He would throw away the new club and be like, no, this is not working for me, okay? So in your sample, if you didn't get evidence towards what you were looking for, Problem over. You don't need fancy stats. You just use common sense. If Mike swings with this new club and does worse, he's not using statistics. Okay? What's going to end up happening in a significance test? He did a little better. 15 versus 13.9. But you have to ask yourself, is that enough of a difference that it's a big deal or not? Is a 13.9 possible, probable, if you're actually a 15? Or is that too big of a deal that, wow, something's going on here? That's where the statistics comes into play. So in order to figure out how big of a deal that 13.9 is, we need to find a p-value. Right now, we don't know how to find a p-value. They're just going to give one to us, and then we'll like learn how to do that later on in the chapter. So before we get to that, what are the two explanations for why Mike got a 13.9? Well, the first option is that the new club actually is better. He got a 13.9 and it happened because the new club actually does better than his old golf club. The other explanation is that the new club isn't better and our lower S occurred due to chance. In other words, the new club is just as good as the old club. He just got a lucky sample or a misleading sample where, oh, out of these 50 shots, we just so happened to get a lower standard deviation. Okay. And then when you get those set up, though, you think about those two possibilities there. We're going to find the probability of option two. We got to know what that chance actually is, and that will guide how we make our decision. So they do some fancy statistics. We don't know how yet but they do some statistics and they come back to Mike with a p-value of 28%, or sorry, 0.28, don't, p-value is 0.28. Interpret this p-value in context. So pause me and use the little script I gave you last slide to write your own um, p-value interpretation. I'll pause myself and I'll put up the answer and we'll talk about it. All right, so I have the little script written out right there, and let's talk about what it's saying. Assuming that the new golf club is no better than the old golf club. So assuming HO is true, the probability of getting that 13.9 that we got due to chance is approximately 28%. So if his new golf club is no better than the old golf club, there's still a 28% chance of getting a 13.9 or something even crazier than that, 13.5, 13.1, etc. So what you do in this situation is you think about what that means. There's a, like, I, I'm gonna oversimplify a little bit right here, but I think it's helpful for visualizing and like wrapping your head around what's going on. There's basically a 28% chance that this new golf club he's about to buy isn't any better. And he's just getting fooled by a low, sample, basically. So when you're trying to figure out, well, what do I do in this problem? You have to kind of ask yourself, like, what's the risk? What's going on right here? If Mike has a lot of money to spend and he doesn't really care, golf clubs, I assume are expensive. I don't golf, but they're probably pretty expensive. If he's got tons of money, then whatever. Yeah, I'll buy this golf club, even if there's a 28% chance that it's basically no better than my old golf club. But then you can look at the flip side of that and you can be like, well, 28%, like that's a pretty good deal. There's probably going to be 
a difference in this golf club right here. If you look at the other side of that, 72% or something like that. So when you're looking at this problem and you're making your decision, there's not going to be a single like, this is what you do in this scenario. You kind of take the probability that they give you and you make your decision based on that. If Mike doesn't have very much money to spare, 28% might be too high of a chance that he's buying something. He's wasting money on a club that doesn't actually help. So you have a lot of gray area and a lot of um, kind of at your discretion when you're making choices on problems like this. So this is a long video with lots in it here. We have one last big piece that we need to talk about. That is the concept of a significance level. And this is getting at what I just finished talking to you guys about, which is like, where do you put that line? What is your comfort level with risk, with figuring out what's going on in these problems? The significance level is a cutoff for how rare or for how low a p-value must be for you to be convinced. Convinced, I'll put um, convinced of HA. That'll make more sense after we talk about it. The variable that we use for a significance level is going to be alpha. Greek letter alpha looks sort of like a fish, like this. So the symbol we use for significance level is going to be alpha. So I just got done talking about how 28% is kind of a high probability. If I was Mike and I did not have very much money to spare, I probably wouldn't be comfortable throwing down a few hundred bucks on a golf club that has basically a 28% chance of not being any better. So depending on how low that probability is, you're going to make a different decision. Let's say instead of a 28% chance of that golf club being no better, there was like a 0.001% chance, really low probability then I'm going to feel pretty good about buying that golf club because it probably actually is better. So there are going to be two kind of scenarios that you follow when you're doing a significance test. And I'm going to write this next bubble right here, this next section, one of the most important parts of the slides today. So put a couple of big stars by this guy. And then if you want to put it at the top, this is a script for your conclusions. I'm going to pause and write them up and then we'll talk about what they mean. All right, I've got the two kind of scripts right here for the two thought processes that you would use in a conclusion and how you make your decision on a significant sense. This is one of the most important things in the whole chapter. Don't get this confused with the p-value interpretation stuff, the earlier script in this lesson. You need to know both of them and they do slightly different things. So I'm going to explain this in the context of Mike and his golf clubs here, because I think that's easier. Remember what was going on in that problem is that our HO was that the new club is just as good as the old club. And the HA was going to be that the new club is actually better than the old golf club. Our p-value in the Mike problem was 28%, 0.28. That's pretty high. Generally, when you do a significance test, the most common values for your significance levels are small alphas. 0.05 is the most common. You can also have 0.01 or 0.10 or 0.001. So these are the kind of significance levels that we use frequently as cutoffs. I'm just going to go with 5%. Okay. So in the Mike problem, we had a 28% p-value. P-value was 0.28. That would put us in this second scenario right here. 0.28 is bigger than alpha. It's bigger than 0.05, which is our cutoff. What does that mean? Well, it means that the risk of the new club actually not being better is too high. So we fail to reject the concept that the new club, we fail to reject the concept that the new club is no better 
In other words, we're not convinced that the new club is actually better. We do not have convincing evidence that the new club is better, okay? When you do one of these problems here, you never say that you accept HO. So write this as another big note here. There's a lot going on here. Never accept HO. The chances are that even with a p-value of 0.28, the new golf club probably is better. There's only a 28% chance that our results are a fluke. But that is too high of a chance for us to be convinced. There's too much risk of being wrong where we're not going to put out that money and say, okay, yeah, I'm convinced that the new club is actually better. Let's say in the same golf club problem, we got a probability of 1% instead for our people, like 0 0.01. In that situation, we'd be in this first scenario here. We'd have a low enough p-value that it is less than our alpha, less than our significance level of 0.05. That would cause us to reject the idea that the golf clubs are the same. We would then have convincing evidence. We'd be convinced that actually the new golf club is better. So if the p-value is low enough in a small p-value situation, you reject the status quo and you say, okay, yeah, I'm convinced by what I was looking for. I'm convinced by the evidence I've found. If the p-value is not low enough, you fail to reject HO. You don't say, oh yeah, the club is definitely just as good as the old one. You just say the evidence wasn't good enough for me to actually be convinced and spend that money, okay? This script right here takes some getting used to, but you'll get really good at it, but it's a really important concept. Common errors in significance test conclusions are forgetting contexts and not explicitly comparing the p-value to alpha. This video has a lot in it, and we're running kind of long. I have one more practice slide right here. One last problem. The next lesson should be a little quicker, and we'll practice putting all of this together, and you'll get some extra experience with it. So brand new problem here to finish off our lesson. So this guy, Xenon, is doing his AP stats project on potato chips and comparing generic to um, name brand chips and seeing what the preference is. So P is going to be the proportion of students who prefer the name brand chips. He goes in saying, hey, you know what? Name brand chips are no more popular than generic chips. They're equally popular. In other words, the percent of people who like the name brand is 50%. The percent who don't is also 50%. But he suspects that actually people will like the name brand chips better. So his alternative hypothesis is that actually the percent who like the name brand is greater than a 0.5. That's what he's going to try to find evidence for. So he does some fancy statistics. We don't know what yet. He just does some math. He gets a p-value of around 7%. Okay? So it didn't tell us in the problem what his p hat is. We don't know what he actually got for his sample, but whatever that value is, if it's 60%, 52%, whatever it is, the chances of getting that value are about 7%. So with a 7% level of risk, probably what that means, probably it means that whatever he got in his sample is actually due to people liking name brand chips more. There's only a 7% chance, if I'm gonna talk about a p-value interpretation right here, assuming that the name brand chips are no more popular, there's about a 7% chance of getting whatever he got in his sample or more extreme due to chance. But depending on what you set as your significance level, your acceptable level of risk, you would make two different conclusions here in this problem. In this first situation here, our threshold for risk was like a 10%. We got a 7% in our sample. Well, since our p-value is 0.074, which is less than our 
acceptable level of risk, 10%, we are going to reject HO. There is convincing evidence for HA. So there is convincing evidence that the true proportion who like name brand chips is greater than 0.5. So our p-value was low enough that we are convinced we reject HO. We say, you know what? We're pretty convinced that, hey, they're not the same proportion, that name brand chips aren't equally popular. We're, we have convincing evidence in our sample that the true proportion is actually greater than, HA, than 0.5. So we have evidence that's convincing that HA is actually the case. So practice on this second example, same setup, but all we do is we change our significance level to a 0 0.05. So pause and try to write your own conclusion for that. All right, so I have a little conclusion written out right here. I did word it differently just to show you guys a different way you could have done it. The last one I talked about P being actually greater than 0.5. Here, I just put it in terms of the chips being more popular. Either way is totally acceptable. One is not better than the other. But let me tie this together and talk about the difference between these two A and B answers. The evidence that actually happened in the problem when this guy collected his sample, the evidence is the same. Our sample yielded this p-value right here. This would be like two different people looking at the same evidence. Let's say you are part A and I am point B, part B. You and I just have different thresholds for how impressive something needs to be before we're convinced. So you sitting there with your 0.10, you're like, wow, that's 7%, that convinces me, I'm sold. I think that the chips actually, name brand chips, are more popular. So you look at the same evidence and you're like, wow, I'm convinced. I'm a little more strict in what convinces me. I'm a little harder to impress with my 5% threshold right here. So I look at that same evidence you saw, you were convinced, I'm not quite convinced. I'm like, hmm, that's not strong enough evidence to really blow me away. So when I look at this problem, that doesn't mean I think that, oh yeah, the name brand is equally popular. Name brand's not impressive. Probably the name brand actually still is better. Just the evidence that I saw wasn't quite enough to convince me. That is why we fail to reject HO and we don't say that we accept it. I'm not accepting that the name brand is equally popular, I'm just not quite convinced that it is more popular. So I'm not convinced by the evidence at hand.